don't think that, oh, I can't afford to have a baby. You're not the one that provides for the baby. Allah writes the risk. Allah is the one that provides sustenance. If somebody thinks that, oh, I can't afford a baby, then the whole mindset is wrong. Let me ask you this. Is it a far stretch? You know, you know the where God Almighty Allah is talking about when the female baby, when she is brought back and asked for what crime was she murdered? Uh, today, there's a big debate, you know, now with the overturning of the abortion with the road. What's the, so you've, you've been, have you followed this? Have you kind of up to speed? Uh, You know, for, for let's say a child or a, a baby who sex is now determined in the womb. Can you, is it a long stretch to go ahead now and to connect it where, because you have even some Muslims now in this state who are confused, or maybe they have some leaders also who are, you know, promoting this. My daughter today texted me, she's in Minneapolis, she's 19, and she said, Mom, is there, is this it? Is this it? Is there nothing that can be done? I cried after I read that text message, and it's hard for me to admit that because I don't like telling people I cry. But I sat there recognizing that for 13 states in the United States, that after 30 days, this is it. And for another 13, it's going to also be it. And it could be it for 50 if we do not act. And how, what's the Islamic position regarding abortion? Because this is an area where you can say that Christians and Muslims, there is a common understanding on this, the fight for for human, for life. The size of a 20 week baby is the size of the length of my hand from the head to the rump, not including the feet. The average baby at this gestation will weigh 500 grams. The suction machine will remove from around the baby the pale yellow amniotic fluid that has been surrounding and protecting the baby. Now with babies this big, they won't fit through a suction catheter. The baby's bones and skull are quite strong. They cannot be torn apart by the suction alone. The instrument used to carry out the termination of pregnancy is a forceps, a grasping forceps. It is a metal high quality instrument, uh, 13 inches or so in length. The active end of the instrument is about two and a half inches in length and it has teeth within the instrument which when it grasps a structure will not let it go easily. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or a leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the body of the baby. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed, along with other body organs, the intestines, the spine, the heart and the lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head because at this stage of pregnancy, the baby's head will be the size of an average plum. It simply won't come through the cervix. In order that this is removed, one needs to crush the skull. This requires inserting the grasping forceps and placing it around the head and crushing the baby's head. That will, of course, cause damage an injury to the skull bones and one will know that one has achieved that by observing a yellowish creamy fluid moving through the cervix that will be the brains of the baby. The abortionist then will collect the various parts of the body and reassemble them to check that there are two arms, two legs and so on. Once all the parts have been accounted for 
the abortion procedure is complete. For the woman, this procedure carries significant risks. Major complications can occur, including perforation of the uterus or laceration of the cervix, with possible damage to the bladder, the bowel, and other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur and is not rare. These complications can lead to massive hemorrhage, septicemia, and include death. Future pregnancies are also at greater risk for loss because of premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix and uterus. What I have described is an operation that will be done from 14 weeks of pregnancy through to 24 weeks of pregnancy. It's very gruesome. The reality of abortion, particularly second trimester, is very gruesome. And then you have another side, but there's also, obviously there's the exceptions, right? You can talk about that, but what's the, the, what's the Islamic stance on this abortion? Islam is a religion that is a divine religion, meaning it's a religion that was revealed uh, from the creator. So we have a, a balance which you don't find in anything man-made, right? So in essence, human life has to be protected, right? And the child in the womb past the first stage, the first trimester you could say and so on, it is alive. There is a beating heart, there is flesh, there is thought, there is a brain. Um, in Islam, we don't believe that it's okay for somebody to murder that child as a form of contraceptive, you know, as a form of, you know what, uh, I, I didn't use whatever protection, so now I'm going to murder this child. Uh, what fault is it of that child, right? We don't believe that. At the same time, there are certain times, because Islam is a very practical and balanced religion, that there could be an exception to the rule in the sense that maybe the life of the mother is in danger, the life of the child and the mother are in danger. There are some pregnancies that we can, uh, you know, professional medical doctors can say that both the child and the mother would be uh, in, in danger of their life if this went forward. And then you would look at how far the pregnancy is and you have a whole system of fiqh in Islam to determine that. One of the calamities of our time is Muslim politicians are not looking at what is right from wrong. They're not looking at moral code. They're not looking at the Quran. They're not looking at the Sunnah. They're not looking at the Sharia. Ah. They're not looking at what is the divine message of Islam. They're looking at political alliances. And this is a calamity. And we saw this coming. Early on, when mosques started to have uh, political parties and started to have uh, politicians come and give speeches and they started to have Muslims get involved with Democrats and Republicans in this party and that party, I used to raise the red flag and say, look, you guys are talking about a maslaha, you're talking about a, a need of greater good, but you realize this is going to take you down a path where you're going to become part of that system, where if you are in a certain political party, you're going to have to uh, stand for certain principles just to keep your position in that party. And America is not, you know, we talk about a, a free country in the sense anybody can become president, but really you can't. I mean, if we're being honest, there's two parties. There's, you've never seen a Green Party or Libertarian or anybody even come close, and not in our lifetime. Right? So you have Republicans and Democrats. And these are the two parties that if you're going to have a president, it's going to be one of those two parties. And to get to where you can even get to that platform to be able to run, you have to fall in line with their principles, not your Islamic principles, not your Christian principles, not your Jewish principles, not your uh, Buddhist principles. You have to be in line with their. So you will see people who are Christians, who are Catholics, who are Muslims, but because they have a certain letter, whether it's an R or a D in front of their candidate name, they will sacrifice their religious principles for these uh, political goals. Right? Biden, for example, he's a Catholic. right? And the Catholic Church, according to their doctrine, are against abortion. But Biden, he's pro-abortion. Why? Because politics. And our Muslim brothers and sisters, may Allah protect us and protect them. Amen. We make dua for them. We're not here to attack people. We're here to uh, any, supplicate for them and for their good and to protect our ummah from their mistakes. 
are falling down that same mistake. They are taking political stances, sacrificing the Sharia. And I want to be very clear, as a Muslim, we have to live by the Qur'an, what Allah has revealed, in accordance with the way of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. And we have to live by that divine code. And if we overturn or try to do away with even a letter, even a single ruling, knowing that this is the ruling from Allah, and we go against it, not that we make a mistake or sin, everybody sins, but we say, no, this haram, this forbidden thing is permissible, or this permissible thing is forbidden, this will take you outside the fold of Islam. This is something that takes you outside the fold of Islam. Allah has forbid killing. Allah says that I have forbidden, for in the Hadith Qudsi, that I have forbidden zulm, oppression, on myself and on you, so don't oppress each other. I, he has forbid us from killing. In the Quran, it tells us killing one soul unjustly is like killing all of mankind. So a five-month-old fetus that is, you know, has teeth and, and all of that, and you abort it for what? For what reason? Oh, I don't feel like I, I'm having a baby today. It was getting, wasn't it getting to the point where it was uh, six months in, seven months in, eight months in, not full term, about to look, and they were still doing this. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue is when we talk about terms and we talk about abortion, even, even when we look at the, the, the reasons for it, it shocks me. Sometimes there's a... But hold on, my, my, but, the, but the thing is, my body, my choice. Well, well that's, that's interesting when we say that, my body, my choice. So, you know, when you have a you know, five, six-month-old child in your stomach, what about that child's body? And their choice, you know, is that not a human being? You know, this is something amazing to me that, and think about this, all these people making these statements, imagine if their parents had done that. Imagine if me and you, and may Allah protect us all, if mm. my parents had said, you know, my body, my choice, you know, mm. uh, for what? There is no risk to health. There is no, if you think you can't provide for a child, Remember, Allah is the one that provides. How many children are born and raised in orphanages and end up becoming millionaires and billionaires? Mm. You know, Steve Jobs, for example, his dad wasn't there. And they had whatever, and his dad left, didn't raise him. And he was one of the richest men in the world. Right? Many people like this, you will find from very humble beginnings, where even Obama, for example, his dad left, his mother raised him as a single mother, all of that. He became the president of the United States. So don't think that, oh, I can't afford to have a baby. You're not the one that provides for the baby. Allah writes the risk. Allah is the one that provides sustenance. If somebody thinks that, oh, I can't afford a baby, then the whole mindset is wrong. Right? If you ever look at a bird, what happens? They, they go out in the morning from their nest and they go and search and come back with worms and their stomach is full. Who provides for them? You look at whales and you look at, Sharks in the ocean, who provides for them? Allah provides for them. Allah will provide for the child. That's not an issue. But people that murder children that are for many months into it, where they have developed a heartbeat, they have, they have developed uh, limbs, they've developed, this is murder. This is not acceptable in Islam. It's not acceptable in Christianity. It's not acceptable in Judaism. It's not acceptable in anyism. No religion in the world allows this. Mm -hmm. And people who want to go by that, it's not about, I mean, you know, again, I'm not trying to get into the political divide of pro-choice and pro-life and things. This is just basic morality. This is basic Islamic and Christian uh, and Judaism, is basic ethical moral code that's in the divine text. We cannot kill children because we just don't feel like having a baby that day.